Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here today with Bruce McCurdy. Hey, Bruce, you're looking fresh out of the clean out of the shower there. Yeah, yeah, I am after my walk and after a long mm. overnighter watching the Perseid meteor shower. I feel slightly refreshed for the for the uh, for the shower. So shower for a shower. Uh, some Oilers news today, Bruce. They look like they've made their final um, signing, defensive signing. I'm just guessing. Maybe they're going to bring in another guy. Who knows? But they, they re-signed uh, Slater Cuckoo. And I was hoping to see that, quite honestly. I have been uh, reasonably impressed with him. We're going to talk about that and this just the little summation of the Oilers' defense, where they're at. And uh, the next five prospects on our Cult of Hockey prospects list. And those players are in no particular order. Michael Kesselring, Ilya Konovalov, Marcus Niemalainen, Tyler Tulio, and Cooper Marodi. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, each of those players and what happened to them this past season. Bruce, what's your take on the Cuckoo signing? What did you think of it? Uh, I was a little startled to see the two-year term, and I was a little startled to see the a fairly major hike in the in the um, uh, in the value of the second year of the contract. I honestly thought that last year he was nip and tuck to have shown enough to earn a one year uh, contract. Uh, you know, at uh, uh, at the going rate, and uh, they gave him the NHL minimum for the first year, but then uh, 1.1 million dollars for the second year, which is. Uh, you know, three hundred fifty thousand dollar difference between the two years. It seems pretty significant for, uh, um, for you know. I mean, they're it's down in the margins. It's a fully variable amount. But for any time that he's on the roster, he's going to cost one hundred seventy five thousand dollars more than a player who is at the NHL minimum. And when uh, when you spent your budget on the big ticket items at the top, those little dribs and drabs, 175,000, I'd pay my salary for a while, but you know, I mean, it's it's a, a fairly significant difference between uh, even down in the margins. You got to, you got to really got to, got to, to, uh, to, to uh, market real tight. So uh, that part of it kind of surprised me. I'm not too surprised that they brought him back. Um, I think they liked what they saw. <clears throat> I think he had, uh, uh, he had some good moments. Uh, statistically, his year wasn't great, but it wasn't really a year. You know, it was like five or six weeks. He only played 18 games. Uh, he was in the lineup at the time of the year that the team was struggling defensively, and I think that showed up on on some of his uh, 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 of his stats. Like he was on the ice at even strength five on five for four goals, four and 12 against. Well, you know, that's not particularly great, but. Uh, like I say, he played more at the beginning of the season when Mike Smith was out and the Oilers were still getting their systems together. And he missed the part where the team was kind of cruising along. And if you want to say, well, that's because he wasn't there and they had a better player in his place. Well, uh, that's maybe your opinion and not mine. But uh, and by you, I mean, the you know, the audience. Uh, but I'd, I like I say, I think one year made more sense than two, but. He's there. I mean, they got they got Nurse and Keith locked up for two years, right? And uh, they've got uh, on the left side uh, Philip Robery and Dmitry Smorkov pounding on the door. And I guess they view uh, uh, Cuckoo as a depth insurance defenseman, which they're going to need at some point. But you know, they've taken themselves out of that market where they could maybe shop for for uh, a different guy next summer. Yes, so they're, uh, when Chris Russell's contract ends this year, they'll and Loggison's contract ends yes. this year, they will have a depth defenseman locked up. Now, whether you need to do that or not is debatable. And, and it depends ultimately on what you think of Slater Cuckoo as a player. And I, I quite liked him, Bruce, so I, I'm happy with this deal. Um, I, I would have preferred it be one year, yes. Two years doesn't bother me. He's in the prime of his career. Now, he has been a little bit injury prone, um, but he is in the prime of his career. If he's going to play well, it's going to be right now. The orders need players to play well. It's right, it's right now. They're going for it. They're all in. 
So, um, but really, I just liked the player. I, I didn't know what to expect from him coming in to Edmonton. Um, and I just, I, I, I thought he did a very strong job. He's a better puck mover than Russell or <laughs> Logason, which is not, you know, the highest of praise. Uh, might be called damning with faint praise. But I think he's actually at least an average puck mover um, in the NHL. He moves the puck pretty well. Uh, you know, I guess if he was put up to a top four role, he wouldn't, he'd be, you know, compared to top four D-man, he might be a little below average in terms of both puck moving and defending. But in terms of bottom pairing, bottom pairing depth defenders, I think he's above average in both categories. He's a, a solid puck mover for that category of defenseman and a solid defender. He isn't a big hitter, but he does get his body in the way of opposing players. Um, to the extent when I, when he came back from being injured and got in the playoffs, I thought he did well. I mean, he, he was part of the, uh, the general panic after, I think it was Ethan Bear's turnover, if I'm not mistaken, or it might've been, was he out there for that moment or was it another big moment? Was, do you recall? I can't hear you for, for some reason, all of a sudden. Ethan Bear coughed the puck up and yeah. Cook tried to make the hero play and he went sliding right by everything. And then the goal developed from there because basically both defensemen took themselves out of the play one way or another. And after that, uh, uh, the coach, uh, Dave Tippett, benched four of the five guys on the ice, including Cuckoo, for the entire rest of the game. He never played a minute of the last 60 in overtime. Uh, you know, the game went long, 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 and they uh, they played with a short bench the entire time. And there was some... Uh, uh, it, it's a tough call in overtime because, of course, you have no idea in advance that it's going to go they three periods played, of overtime. They should have but, played oh, Cuckoo. Oh. That was a mistake. Come on. it was just That's just a mistake. Yeah, yeah I, I think so, he, too. He had played well up until then. It wasn't his. It's so typical after a horrendous turnover like that was for everyone else to essentially lose their minds, including the player who's made the turnover. Everyone's just panicked after that because it's the, yeah. the, if things happen are happening fast out there, very yeah. fast. And uh, that's what happened on that play. I don't particularly blame Cuckoo on the play. Like, I mean, he was responsible for the goal against as much as other people, you know, mm -hmm. other people on the ice, not named Ethan Bear, but he wasn't the only one who was in right. panic mode. And I, I, he played well. I thought he played well all year. So the, the only reason the, this does hurt you, I guess, if you get sent to the minors then and they replace him with the players. But if he's with the Oilers, the, the second year term doesn't really matter as much like if he's actually on the team as a functional player so i, I would see him as the seventh defenseman probably next year right. and as the seventh defenseman i don't mind him I, I believe he can play both sides i think he yes. he has that capability yeah. so he's yeah i um i'm fine with the signing and you know russell is probably he slipped a little last year he's going to slip a bit more this year L legison could step up i mean there was times last year bruce when legison was playing with adam larson when uh, they look like a decent shutdown pairing for about four or five games in a row there. And then Legison's game started to fall apart. He just couldn't handle it. But as Legison may still step up as a third pairing D-man, but it'll be, you know, he and he and Cuckoo are there. If they don't make it, they can they can get put on waivers. They can get cut. It's, it's no skin off the Oilers' nose because um, it doesn't really hurt you against the cap, except, as you point out, in that second year uh, a, a wee bit. So... More well, signings both, like both years, though, because of because of the second year, it raised the average level. Oh, what's the average? I thought it was nine thought. nine twenty five. You see, you got seven fifty the first year, one point one million the second. So the but you now, can bear and that, you in you the, can bear uh, yeah. When, if you cut the guy right off the team, but if he's in the press box or whatever, he's you know he's that oh, one hundred and seventy five grand minimum. above the minimum. So I it's see going, you know there's okay. there's marginal cost for doing that. Guy, I understand it's that. It's pretty marginal. I mean, to put it in the bigger picture, and I'm sure Oilers Twitter is all in a howl about this as they were about Devin Shore is a very similar example of a guy with poor underlying numbers who got a two-year extension. Uh, 925000 is literally 10% of the amount they just committed to Darnell Nurse per year and for four times as long in the case of Nurse. So it, it's a small issue it's not a big issue it's so relaxed people it's a small thing they're they're trying to, to they're trying to shore up the margins of their roster 
and time will tell us whether it was a good decision or not. I'm, but I'm not going to say today what a brutal move by Holland. You know, it's just the I'm comfortable is saying just it was not a, in yet. Yeah, I'm comfortable saying it was a good move. I think it was a good move. So, I mean, just based on his play last year, I thought he did well. And uh, uh, I I noticed like there were some negative comments from people who put a lot of weight in shot metrics from mm -hmm. Andy and Rono. I don't know who they are. They seem to be prominent mm -hmm. shot metrics people. Yep. And I said, you know, this is typical. Like, you know, you go by numbers. This is the kind of player that, you know, that's going to get it criticized. And I, I didn't see it. I saw a decent player last year. And um, um, then some other analytics types weighed in and said, no, uh, we actually rate him pretty well. So I don't know. I, I, well, I even Andy and Rono, I put their tweet in my post because it yeah. made both points that, that Cuckoo had good numbers in Chicago and poor numbers in, in Edmonton. And they came to the to the conclusion, as did I, that, you know, the jury's out, that he may well recover that form that he showed in Chicago. And uh, uh, as depth defensemen go, it's not that bad of a bet. And, uh, I mean, we'll see. But when you see uh, uh, an analytics metric that says a guy was in the 97th percentile in a particular category one year and in the first percentile the next year, chances are it's not just that guy. It's probably... The circumstances in which he found himself, and they very much changed for uh, for Slade Cuckoo. Yeah, I can't speak to him how he played in Chicago, but I thought he was a good player last year in Edmonton in the role he was being used in. I thought he succeeded. Bruce, uh, let's talk about these prospects. Um, why don't we start? Who would you like to start with? Do you have uh, one of them teed up? Do you want uh, me yeah, well, let's stick with the defenseman. Let's talk about Marcus. Neiman Linen, yeah, uh, who is a left defenseman who's in the system and now finds himself behind uh, one more guy. You know, he's got Chris Chris Russell, uh, William Lagason, and uh, now Slater Cuckoo at the NHL level, uh, all fighting for the third defenseman role. The top two are locked up with uh, Keith, uh, a nurse, and Keith in that order. Uh, so you've got those three guys. You've got two other young guys who we'll encounter much later in our prospect series near the top in Brobury and Samarkov. And where does that leave a guy like Marcus Niemelainen? Does he have any shot at all of making this team or is he just, you know, eventually, or is he just so buried down the list now that uh, uh, that he's basically a no-hoper, right? You know, how 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 is he feeling, you think, about... Uh, uh, the signings within the Oilers' defense in terms of his future chances of making it. He's probably not that happy, but on the other hand, I'm happy. I think it's you, you can never have enough players who can play defense at the NHL level. We've seen in previous years that sometimes you got to go 8, 9, 10 on your depth chart as they get injured, as NHL defensemen are wont to do. So Marcus Niemelainen may well get his shot. His job is to, you know, he's a 6'5", six, six, 205, he's listed here on Hockey DB. Right. I think he might be bigger than that. He he broke in, uh, he was a third overall pick in 2016, uh, played in the OHL, and uh, looked like a pretty decent prospect because of his good size and good skating. And people were hoping his puck skills would pick it up over the years. They never really have. But he... he from what I saw in Bakersfield, Bruce, I, I didn't mind his game at all. He's a, he's a mm -hmm. he is a great big guy. He's very solid defensively. He seemed to be a bit of a have a bit of a mean streak, and his passing was okay. So he um, he's kind of a bigger version. Uh, well, he's not quite as good with the puck as William Loggison. He's like William Loggison on defense, which is which is a fairly effective hockey player, but he he's not quite the puck mover. So. Mm -hmm. Nima Linen's job is to to go to the AHL this year and kick butt as a top four D-man, playing the penalty kill and as a shutdown D-man. And if he can do that, uh, I think, could he be an Edmonton owner? Ed, listen, the Edmonton owners, because of these big contracts to Darnell Nurse and McDavid and Dreisaitl and other players, they're going to need lots of players who earn around a million dollars a year in the years to come. He could be one of them. He could step up and um, rise to the top and get a job. Now, the two years on Cuckoo would probably be, he wouldn't be happy about that. I agree with you, Bruce. That wouldn't be, that wouldn't be welcome because it kind of shuts it down a little bit for next year. On the other hand, if he's a lot better than, than mm -hmm. Cuckoo, 
he could he could take that job. Cuckoo could be in the minors. They could bury that contract. Yeah, well, he's on a two-way deal, of course, so it's a lot cheaper for the Oilers to bury Nimalainen yeah. down there in terms of real real cash dollars. Anyway, he, uh, uh, I didn't see him very good in the game that he played, uh, or one of the games that he played that uh, I was scouting this year in Finland, but I saw him a lot better in in, uh, in Bakersfield, and uh, he's just a big gangly guy that gets in the way a lot, eh? And that, that's... Uh, uh, those kind of guys, they've been hanging around the NHL forever. You know, not every team has one, but a lot of teams do. And he's he certainly raised his stock in the last uh, one to two years, Nima Linen, after looking like he was going nowhere. He could be the new Hawk and Paw and Slash, you know, mm. and, and get a three-year contract down the road in the NHL. Sometimes it takes a while for these great big guys to make it to the NHL. Let's talk about another defenseman then, Michael Kesselring. Sure. Um, drafted sixth round, 164th overall in 2018. So that's getting real low on the draft, Bruce. It's not very mm-hmm. likely someone drafted that low is going to make the NHL. But ever since he's been drafted, Michael Kesselring, it's just been one up arrow after another. He um, he did well at Northeastern University, two years running. Uh, worked his way up the lineup. Worked his way into the top four. And um, played well. He's he's listed at 6'4", 205, but his father, Casey Kesselring, uh, has told me that he's more like 6'4", 215, I think. Okay. And uh, is working on his skating like crazy this summer. Good. And um, Bruce, I, I, I like this. He's a right shot D-man who can skate, mm-hmm. um, who can move the puck, who seems to have really good hockey sense and is, uh, seems to be a very competitive player as well. Mm-hmm. He played 21 games in Bakersfield. He got uh, three points. So, you know, it was he, he got his feet wet in the AHL. I think it's too early to say much more than that. Um, but he's you got a, right, a big right shot defenseman who can skate. That player's got a chance in a few years. 21 years old, came out of college early after his second season. Clearly has been uh, 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 tracking towards the pro career the entire time i think from what we know of this player and certainly through your contact with uh uh with his dad and the podcast that you did last summer like i wasn't surprised at all that he signed as soon as this year was out like say he played 21 games that's a lot just due to the due to the time lag nature of the season usually a college guy gets out and into the ahl he only plays a handful of games and then the next season is over and then, of course, he played the full six in the playoffs, got three more points, including a couple of assists in the decisive uh, game that won the uh, Condors, the, uh, uh, the Pacific Division crown. So, you know, just a nice experience for those guys. I, I love that they had a playoffs down there. And I really like that they came through with a series of tough games and they won a few few sort of do or die games and tough one goal games. And I think that's good experience for everybody on the team. Like, great they got some you know they got they got got some hard miles under their belt and certainly the oilers could use players in the longer run that are used to actually winning playoff games right so uh, <laughs> it's uh uh he he um uh, we've seen him at the last two development camps which we're going back a ways in time now but he impressed both of us at both camps and also impressed by the by the by the strides he made from the first camp to the second one. By the second camp, he was one of the better players out there, and he was just, you know, finishing, just even going into his freshman season. I kind of these things so run together Must now. Been, I guess Bruce. it was it was 2019. So yeah, yeah, he would have just been going into his freshman season, and and he looked uh, uh, he looked uh, very impressive. Like his basic skill set. Is strong, like he moves all right, and you know, and he uh, he's an ag- aggressive uh, player, and of course, three on three hockey. Usually, a six foot five college defenseman that's not going to show him in his best light, but he looked good in that uh, in that format on that occasion. I mean, who knows how consistent he is? That's that's one question I would have about really any young player. They want to have on the Oilers' defense some great, great big guys who can skate and defend, don't necessarily have to be bone crushers, but can skate and defend. 
mm-hmm. and can move the puck. Doesn't mean they have to carry the puck. They want to be able to hit Connor McDavid and Leandre Settel in stride with passes, not yeah. shoot it up the boards. This is the goal. This is what they want, want to head towards. So Niemelainen and, and Kesselring are both in that camp. So if Niemelainen or Kesselring wants to make the NHL, they're going to really have to work on their passing. And, um, you know, mm-hmm. that being the, the ability to retrieve pucks quickly, dig pucks out of corners in control and defensive zone, win a little bit of time and make that pass. That's what it's going to be all about for these big guys. Because I think they're going to be able to defend okay because they can both skate and they're both big. And they both seem to have the right attitude. But that skill, that high level of skill in terms of moving the puck, is going to make the difference. Kessel Ring has a couple of years here where he can play, hey, Kat, uh, in the um, AHL. Uh, so he won't, it's going to, I'm, and he's going to take all those, both those years, I'm pretty sure, to, to develop. So we'll, you know, and that's a, in NHL years, that's a long time from now. So glad to have to see a prospect like this in the system, you know, from a low draft pick. Um, we saw Marino, Caleb Jones, and Ethan Bear all uh, work out to some degree for the Edmonton Oilers. You know, they traded Ethan Bear. They got a, sounds like they got a really good player back in Warren Fogle. We'll see if that's the case or not. Um, they lost Marino because he wasn't going to sign here and he was going to go back. He was going to be a free agent. So that was a tough one. And then Jones was part of the Keith deal, which is the, we'll just call it the controversial Duncan Keith deal at this point. Bruce, let's talk about the forwards. There's a forward on this list we, who we have been tracking a fairly long time by now by the name of Cooper Marodi, mm-hmm. the singing hockey player. Mm-hmm. And uh, who last fall, his career looked just about over to me as an Edmonton Oiler. He went to the Austrian League. He's one of the yeah. many players placed in Europe by the Oilers. Good move. And he went to the Austrian League. He played one game for Dornburn EC, no. and he did not, no points. And then that was it. No. And this was after a season where he had had a great rookie year, a great three-year college uh, career, mm-hmm. uh, marred by injury in one year, but he came back his big year in his final year. Then he, he crushed it in the AHL in his first year. No. He just crushed it. And he looked, to me, not bad in his, in his Oilers he had a few games with the orders, six games with the orders. He didn't get any points, but he looked okay to me. Like he could, he can really dangle at the AHL level. He's very, very good with the puck. And um, then in 2019, uh, 2019-20, uh, he um, had had a weak year at the AHL, 17 points in 30 games. He got it. He was injured through the year, and again, I start to question: Is this guy? What, what's going? Is he ever going to make it? This year, though, he comes in the HL. He gets 21 goals in 39 games. He's one of the top attacking players in the league. And I think uh, he's 24 now. Now, there's lots of people, like I, I did a thing today, young guns who are going to make it on the orders, and I included both Benson and Marodi. And someone came back, well, you know, you had Benson and Marodi on this list. These are, you know, like your list is fraudulent because of this, because these guys are never going to make it. And my response to that is, look at the Tampa Bay Lightning's list of forwards. Mm-hmm. of who have made it there. And how many of them at ages 22, 23, and 24, and Yanni Gord included, were ripping it up in the HL, spending time down there. And there's there's very little to distinguish Cooper Marodi's AHL numbers from Yanni Gord's AHL numbers. Yanni Gord was a great AHL attacker at that age, and so was Cooper Marodi. Now, of course, there's all kinds of other players who are great AHL attackers at age 24 and don't make it in the NHL. I'm well aware of that. But... I don't think you can write players like this off. And I think if you have a plan in mind for them, if you have a way for them to advance and a plan for them to advance, which is what I worry about isn't there for Benson and Marodi, um, that they can become very valuable players on a team uh, that likes to score some goals. And I just, I hope Marodi gets his chance this year with Edmonton. I think he's earned it. And I think he, he might surprise everybody and become a valuable NHL player. Well, he led the AHL in goals last year, for what that's worth. No, it wasn't an equal league where all the teams played the same number of games or anything, but a significant number of them played uh, close to that number of games. Uh, it's better part of, uh, you know, close to 40 games that Bakersfield played in the uh, Pacific Division, 21 goals. Uh, and 
he bounced back, as you say, from the injury plagued year, which began in the playoffs the previous year when Kale Kessie took him out. And uh, that kind of ruined him for an entire year, near, near as we can tell from the dis, you know, the information we have at this distance, was that he was never right in 2019, 20. Uh, but he sure bounced back hard this uh, this past season. Uh, I'm curious to know what happened over there in Europe that he left after one game, whether he got banged up or or whether it just wasn't a fit or he got homesick. I mean, who the heck knows, right? But uh, uh, he's fulfilled his three-year entry-level contract. He's shown uh, promise. The Oilers did make him a qualifying offer. They haven't signed him yet, but once that qualifying offer is in there, uh, it's just a matter of time. He'll probably sign a one-year deal at NHL minimum like Tyler Benson did. And it'll be make or break time come uh, uh, come training camp. But you'd like to think he'd at least get a shot. Uh, his big problem is that he's behind four right-wingers who the Oilers protected <clears throat> in the Seattle expansion draft. So those guys are clearly in the long-term plans of the organization. So... Whether he makes it uh, over one of them, maybe somebody gets banged up along the way. Uh, maybe he makes the roster as a 14th forward and gets in and out of the lineup a little bit. Or maybe he's just one of these quadruple A players that gets cut at the end of the training camp and probably doesn't get picked up by another team because every team seems to have one or two of those guys. So it's I'd like to... I'd like to I, hear what he's doing this summer like his like Benson the thing I hear most often about Marodi as a weakness is that he's not a particularly speedy uh, or powerful skater and that can certainly make or break it we know many many players over the years who can score 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 in the AHL and yet when they get to the NHL they're just a little half step behind you know and it's all the difference so. Sure wheels around nicely in the AHL eh, when he's got the puck on his stick. He's like the, he is the Patrick Kane of the AHL. He just he just circles around them and uh, it's hard to stop that guy. Good but you're right, puck like, on the stick. that's of the AHL. You know mm-hmm. he's got to be the Cooper Modi of the NHL, which is going to be you know probably a third line winger. Um, he does play some center and has played center, but uh, I'm not sure how he does on faceoffs. Bruce, let's move on to Tyler. Tulio, Tyler Tulio, drafted uh, 2020, 126th overall, so another late round, fifth, fifth round draft pick, 5'11", 180 pounds. Um, he had a really interesting story this past year. I mean, in his, in his draft year in junior, 66 points in 62 games, pretty good. And a lot of people were very excited uh, when the Oilers got this player at that part in the draft. They thought a, a good player had fallen to Edmonton. So he was facing, like most of the Ontario players, you know, a lot of them sat around and did nothing all winter because they couldn't get a game at the in the OHL. But he uh, went over to the Slovakian league where he played for HK32, Liptovsky Mikulas. <laughs> and he played 19 games, got 13 points. And I just, I just admire the kid. I think he set this up on his own. And I admire him, or his dad did. I think his dad's a owner of one co-owner of the generals or something anyway i admire him and he did well he's playing in a men's league you know not a great men's league uh below the ahl level uh men's league probably considerably below ahl level but better than the austrian league where marody played one game he got 13 total points in 19 games again and uh you know he's he's known as a kind of a feisty attacking player he and he made the he was invited to the team canada world junior camp this summer so um that's pretty good for a fifth round draft pick bruce to to get invited to, to team canada and uh he he did end up the year in bakersfield and he didn't get any playing time there he couldn't crack the lineup there in right. bakersfield. But he was there around the coaches around the players mm-hmm. and now he's going back for a final year in oshawa right what do you make yeah. of him yeah one thing that stood out to me from his uh time in uh uh Lipkovsky Mikulis of the uh, Slovakian League yeah. in 19 games, 77 minutes in penalties. This is a feisty guy. Like he, they, it, all the scouting reports talk about his willingness to stick his nose in and uh, 
uh, you know, go to the uh, so-called dirty, greasy areas of the ice and apply further grease to said areas. Uh, and yet he's got some skills. I mean, uh, for instance, in the Elite Prospects page, uh, scouting report, they say when the shot isn't an option, Tulio shows a great deal of adaptability, integrating one-touch maneuvers, playing pucks into space, manipulating defenders out of shooting mains. You name it, he can do it. He plays with a high motor and shows real attention to detail on the defensive side. I mean, this is the words of one scout that, you know, maybe watch him play a handful of times. But uh, uh, general, as a general rule, the the uh, guys with a reputation by for being feisty aren't once in a while feisty. That's like part of their yeah. horror makeup. And if, uh, you know, if he's a bit of a, of a, of a uh, disturber, uh, that's not the worst thing. I mean, I'm not sure the Oilers, who the Oilers have, who you would point to and say, this this guy is a guy who will go up and stir things up. Josh Archibald certainly would be such a player, but, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's not a long list. And, He's just a little guy, a eh? 5'11", 181 at this point in his life. Of course, he's still uh, just 19 years old, so he'd likely fill out a little bit. But uh, uh, I, what little I've seen of him, I like, and what more I've read about him, I've also liked. And I, I hold out reasonable uh, hopes that, you know, I mean, he's he's in our second 10 of, of prospects. He's not like on the, on the can't mistrained to the NHL, but uh, he's in there with a fighting chance, and that's for sure. This is one of the best lists of prospects that we've seen. Mm -hmm. It's been getting better the last, uh, you know, can, three, four years. It's just the list, the, the depth uh, of good prospects is greater than it was uh, five years ago. It's getting better all the time, and, and that's why we have a player like this uh, who's a uh, world junior um, tournament possibility, you know, ranking where he does, not not in the top 10. Usually that player would definitely be in the top 10, uh, with the Oilers at least, who have had historically bad prospect lists. Ilya Konovalov, Bruce, what do you mm. think of Ilya Konovalov? He's intriguing. Uh, uh, he's a, um, they draft him as an older player. He's now 23 years old, uh, just turned uh, in July. 23, but just coming over to North America at that age, uh, he's got three f years of experience in the in the KHL, the second best league in the world. Where over those three years, he posted 930, 912, 923 save percentages, and what has uh, become a high save percentage league, like 93% uh, would probably lead the NHL. Whereas in the KHL, you'll find a few guys around there, but uh, he can stop pucks. Uh, and he's done it for uh, uh, for a while now. He's a smaller netminder, just 5'11", uh, which is uh, quite a bit uh, smaller than the uh, prototype in the NHL these days, which is at least 6'3", or 6'4", with a number of guys that are much larger than that. Uh, I mean, just look at the two guys the Oilers have, 6'5", and 6'7", as their main starting goalies, or Stuart Skinner, who's, I think, 6'4", that's... Uh, the guy that Conval is going to be competing with in the minors, but uh, uh, technically he's reported to be very, very sound, very quick, good with his feet. Um, he's an intriguing prospect. How he translates to North America, anybody's guess, but uh, there's any number of European goalies who've come over and excelled. It used to be they they, they had a, a, a rep for not being able to make that transition, but that has completely gone away in recent years, and there's lots of excellent Euro goalies, uh, Russian goalies uh, uh, in the uh, uh, in the NHL. So uh, he's uh, where he fits is the question, right? Does he play behind Skinner and ahead of Rodrigue and and in the minors? You know, where does Stalock fit into that? Uh, into that mess, how many games is he going to get? But uh, they're going to want to give this guy a good look, so they're going to have to figure that out. Yeah, it is a little bit messy, isn't it? Because yep. do you want three goalies on the roster? I mean, probably not. You know, then you do. You know, it's nice to have Stalock around. If Koskinen mm -hmm. doesn't play better this year, you got a fairly mm -hmm. decent bet there to try out before you have to go to the trade market. Um, so I like the fact Stalock's on the team. 
So yeah. I see Konovalov probably, he and Skinner, not splitting games, but, um, you know, maybe Skinner getting three out of every five games. And uh, But we'll see. Konovalov lost his starting job um, to Edward Pasquale last year. Yes. And then Pasquale's game fell apart a little bit, and Konovalov started to get back into it. And so he's been a he's been a very good uh, KHL goalie. And there's a, there are, you know there's always a couple of smaller goalies in the NHL who manage to make it and and become mm-hmm. uh, solid players. So we'll see, we will see. And it's fun that he's coming over to North America this year. Like they can stay forever over there, and, or sometimes never show up. So now we'll get a sense: can he do it or not? Uh, what's what are his AHL numbers going to be like? It's going to be fun to watch the AHL this year, Bruce. Uh, you know, with with uh, Raphael Lavoie and and Kirill Maximov uh, on the attack, other players on defense. Castle Ring. There, there's a there's just a lot of defensemen we're going to be keeping an eye on down there. And of course, uh, Philip Roberry will probably be down there as well, along with Konovalov. So and yeah, I guess I'm going to have to subscribe once 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 yet again. To uh, I don't I don't want to be missing many of Broberry's games. I just uh, and uh, it will, will get the added bonus of being able to see the, all these other players as well. Yeah, well, we've got uh, for example Juicy Saros, uh, yeah. who's emerging as a very strong NHL netminder who's just five ten. I mean, it's yeah. not impossible. Uh, you just got to be real good, real quick. Uh, what they do say is that uh, bigger goalies have bigger holes and. Uh, uh, smaller ones uh, should be, you know, a little tighter in close that they don't have pucks going through them so much, but they have bigger corners. So, uh, but uh, if you're solid enough, uh, you know, ultimately it comes down to technique. So, the market has spoken. I mean, I do think the bigger goalies are the expectation, and uh, they're the ones who get mm-hmm. the job done. Generally speaking, yeah. nonetheless. Uh, there's the ex- it's the exception to the rule. This guy could be that. He's he was fantastic rookie in the KHL. He's had okay to good results since then. So we will find out in Bakersfield this year how this yeah. all plays out. Well, Bruce, I know you got an appointment to to get to. So why don't we cut her cut her off here and uh, we'll uh, talk again when there's uh, some breaking news. Right on. Thanks. Yeah, Thanks we'll for get into our me. top ten next time around. Thanks for yeah. listening, everyone. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast.